Thank you, Zhang Lin. Let me ask you how you came to this field brought, now defined as sustainable urbanism and thinking about cities in a really intensive resource uh, conservation kind of way. Well, thank you, Greg. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I came to this field in a very long, routed way. Uh, I've, I've been interested in population and resource issues uh, ever since the 80s, uh, looking at the traditional you know, Club Rome debate, mosses versus gross, etc. And it's been a fascinating question ever since. Uh, I came to this f field of urban design and certainly only about uh, six, seven years ago uh, when I joined the Energy Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in San Francisco, but have a very uh, extensive practice in China. Uh, we're one of the largest NGOs operating in China. Um, about seven, eight years ago, we started a partnership with Hilly Foundation to look at urban design issues. How, how do you address the massive urbanization challenge in China? And um, simply put, you know, over the next 20 years, there are roughly 350 million people who are moving from countryside to cities in China. And that's equivalent to the entire U.S. population uh, that has to move to cities. So how do you design cities in a way that's both environment friendly, but also li livable to people? Uh, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And that has a, uh, so 350 people, million people moving from the countryside to cities in China. That's just, uh, just trying to absorb and, and understand that. <laughs> What's at stake in terms of global carbon and climate for China's urbanization? What are the stakes if they get it right or, well, if they do it in a low carbon way versus the way we did it? Well, put this way, uh, on per capita basis, uh, every Chinese, citizen use one-tenth the energy average American use. So if they don't do the way right and follow our footstep into a sort of urban sprawl and very high consumption patterns, then there's probably not very easy way for us to get out of the, the trap for, towards uh, global warming. Um, so I think this is actually a very critical challenge. Most of consumption will happen in, in cities. So whether they get a city right, it's essential to try and be on a low emission growth pattern, but also true for the world as well. Yeah, our pattern has been grow now, clean up later. And so uh, what is, let's look at some of the bright spots and, and where China is trying to grapple with this issue and grow in a low carbon way. So what, what are some of the things that are happening China, in China right now? Uh, uh, Ellen Liu, let's, let's ask you in terms of where the low carbon development is happening? Where, where are the leading spots, the bright spots right now? I think what I have observed, which was really special is, you know, since the financial tsunami is the Chinese government spent a lot of money in building up their transit infrastructure. So cities and, you know, different cities racing to Beijing and trying to get that piece of fund so that they can build their subway, light rail, and now they're big into building BRTs. And this Just, is uh, bus rapid bus transit. Rapid transit. Okay. That's right. And this is the case in the first tier cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, as well as second and third tier cities. And so I think that's like one of the best things that they have done. But what's the connection with the financial tsunami and subways? Is that was it a way to stimulate the economy? It wasn't really because of carbon. It was it was because of a way to uh, get people to work and stimulate the economy. Is that right? Right. But instead of building more freeways, they built subways and light rail. Okay. which is hugely different from ours how many years ago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went to Shanghai in 2006. There was one or two subway lines. I went back in 2010 for the World Expo. There was 11 subway lines all over the place, way out into the suburbs. It would take 100 or 200 years to do something like that in the Bay Area. They did it very quickly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that uh, transportation infrastructure, what that means for um, China's carbon footprint. Zhang Lin, you know, is there, do you agree that that, that transportation infrastructure is, is a key part? Definitely. I'm very glad that Ellen brought up the BRT issue, bus rapid transit. This is actually a, a, a technology we helped champion China ever since the early 2000s. Uh, in fact, in 2005, we hosted a very large conference for leading mayors in China to introduce the BRT concept in China. Why don't you tell us what that concept is briefly for people who aren't familiar? Which is essentially operating bus as a subway, but on the ground. Everything else is operating in the same principle as a bus. It's a very high quality, high capacity, and fast. There's a dedicated lane, you pre-board. So everything works as a subway, but you don't have to dig a hole on the ground. So it costs like 
five to ten percent as a subway, and it's much easier to deploy. This is a technology that in money in South America, you know, it was not came out of America. You know, we in fact for many years we hired a group of Brazilian uh, engineers to be de 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 deployed in China, going to different cities to help people to build BRT lines. In fact, the first BRT corridor in Beijing was with our uh, assistance in terms of design in 2005. And, when in, uh, and there's actually quite a few cities now that have BRT corridors and BRT networks. Uh, one of our partner institutions that built one of the largest BRT in Asia, in Guangzhou, which is operating uh, for two or three years now. Um, I think the one the bright spot uh, in terms of transit infrastructure is also high-speed rails, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in the last five to six years, China came out of nowhere and built the largest high-speed rail network in the world. Um, so that's a tremendous uh, benefit, uh, thinking about laying down the infrastructure for the future. Because city, to build a city in terms uh, have a minimal impact on climate, you really need to build infrastructure right. And high-speed rails, public transit are one of the fundamental structures you have to build to allow people to practice a low carbon style. Otherwise, you're locked into much higher uh, carbon uh, density in terms of lifestyle. The other bright spot, I mean, there's other things we can talk about later, but the other bright spot is really the move towards uh, clean energy sources in China. There's a massive amount of investment going to renewables. Uh, since 2005, China has become the largest renewable market in the world, both in terms of deploying wind and solar but also manufacturing them. So they're actually putting a lot of low carbon infrastructure in terms of power plants in the ground as well. But many people say China was building what, the equivalent of a coal fired power plant a week. Is that still true that they're doing lots of clean energy, they're also doing lots of dirty energy? It is still true, yeah. I think as of last year, and that's still on the same pace, uh, but you see the balance is shifting, right? In, in, in used to be the, most investment go into a fossil fuel uh, power plant. Now, close to half, maybe a third, at least a third of investment in power plants are going to cleaner sources. So you see the balance are changing quite dramatically over the last few years. Part of the challenge of, of uh, there's still more coal plant being, being built because there's still very high amount of growth in China. So to, to, to support the growth, you need power. And that's one of the critical challenge that's facing China.